very much. So should we encourage the abandonment of the traditional hierarchical stiff upper lip culture that once embedded privilege or, and, and power, of course, or, and, and should we welcome a necessary shift towards hearing and supporting the vulnerable? Or should we perhaps be wary of a focus on weakness and victimhood which risks undermining the individuals involved and, and damaging social cohesion? Well, this is what we're going to talk about today. Is it the end of the stiff upper lip? Is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? And we have a fantastic panel, I think, to talk about this. So on my right is Peter Tatchell, the human rights campaigner and very brave campaigner for gay rights, who's been arrested more times than I can probably remember. Um, whoop, exactly. Uh, Mina Salami on my left, who is the founder of the award-winning blog Misafropolitan, which connects feminism with critical reflections on contemporary culture from an Africa-centered perspective. And Mina, you were named as uh, one of the 12 women changing the world by Elle magazine, along with Michelle Obama and Angelina Jolie. And on my far left, uh, metaphorically, uh, and not sorry, not metaphorically, but literally, <laughs> once, is David Aronovich, who was once a communist, but is not now. You describe yourself as a radical moderate, yeah. am I right? Yeah. And is a very good and well-renowned columnist for the Times and has won all sorts of awards there. So we're going to start, first of all, each of them is going to give us two or three minutes of their pitch on the question of should we welcome leaving a stiff upper lip culture behind? First of all, Peter. I want to jump straight in to tackle the issue about identity politics because it's often portrayed by critics as being the politics of victimhood. But I would say, in fact, identity politics is the politics of equality and social justice. Why did identity politics come into existence? It came into existence because sections of our society felt marginalized and excluded. It was a reaction to the fact that because people belong to a particular race or belief system, a gender or sexuality or disability group, their issues were not being heard. The mainstream political consensus was not attuned to the rights of women, ethnic minorities, LGBT plus people, disabled people, until identity politics co-organized those groups uh, to campaign for their rights. So it was a very necessary process to redress grave injustices that had been more ignored by the mainstream. Um, of course, I want to add the qualification that as much as I defend identity politics, I also want to defend and succor the mutual bonds that unite us to emphasize the importance of also recognizing our common humanity. While sections of society quite rightly fight their corner, we also need to acknowledge the things that unite us, the things where we can work together, the fact that unity and solidarity is the only way to secure effective, lasting, and universal change. Good, thank you. <laughs> Mina. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to uh, address the description of the debate as well as respond to the question. Um, so first of all, the suggestion that identity politics draws from misfortune um, is one that I find itself to be unfortunate. Groups of people coming together to address systemic oppression and systemic injustice um, doesn't really have to do with misfortune. And secondly, if there's any group in society that has had to be psychologically resilient and stoic and persistent, um, it is actually not the powerful and the privileged who tend to be predominantly male and predominantly white and predominantly belonging to the elite class. Um, by contrast, um, this is, these are groups who are very fortunate. Um, women as a group who are accused of being the weaker sex um, are actually more self-sufficient than men as a group. Um, from the moment that a boy is born, he, has to, he depends on women to 
feed him, to cater to him, to nurture him, to nourish him. Um, and this goes on throughout his life. Whereas young girls are taught from a very early age to, to be able to do these things for ourselves. Um, and needless to say, uh, people of African heritage, people of Asian heritage, and other people of color um, have had to bite their upper lips very firmly in order to survive in this world. Um, so in my view, vulnerability is actually a very privileged emotion. Um, to, be ordered to, to be able to express vulnerability requires that you feel uh, that you have a solid foundation, which means that you have time to, to cultivate a kind of sensibility and sensitivity where you can express your vulnerability. Um, so to respond to the question, I think um, that yes, we should, um, we should encourage a, a, a stiff upper lip culture, um, but by we, I am talking about women, I'm talking about um, people of color. Sorry, I think we should leave it behind. Um, but <laughs> women and people of color, black people, LGBT communities, trans people, all of the disenfranchised, um, we should be allowed to express our vulnerabilities more because we are the people whose voices have been suppressed for so long. David. Um, I think I've rather mistaken what the title of the session was. I, I thought it was Victims and Warriors with an E. Um, I was going to say I'm one of the warriors. Um, uh, I'm very, very worried. Um, um, as to, I'm sure you're right about uh, boys, Mina, but you never met my mother. Um, I'm sure they're exceptions. Uh, uh, so, yeah, of course they're exceptions. <laughs> they are. Um, I, I took this actually discussion to be, uh, I want to take it in a slightly different direction as well as the ones where, 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 where it's gone. What we've been talking about a little bit and hinting about is what people have begun to call identity politics. Funnily enough, when I looked at the perspectives, I understood it to be about what you might call therapy culture. Um, uh, uh, the idea um, that is a relatively new one, that each of us um, has a series of vulnerabilities and potential problems um, which are the consequence, the necessary consequence of being human, that it is a good idea or a bad idea for us to acknowledge and to seek to take action about. Um, and the way I was going to think about this in the first instance was to say that this in terms of Britain at least has been very much a generational question. In other words, if you get the people from different generations, they will take very different attitudes towards it indeed. And I just want to point you towards one specific date, which I think a number of you were sentient for, a number of you very sentient for, and maybe a few of you weren't born for, which is the night of October the 31st, September the 1st, 1997. Um, who can tell me what happened on that night? Princess Diana uh, crashed, uh, a car crashed into, in, into the wall. Now, the reason why, uh, in Paris, the reason why I raised this one in particular was because what then happened publicly, we had never seen, or we said we had never seen anything like it in this country before. And the reaction of certain people to it, particularly Her Majesty the Queen, who is enormously highly regarded, not least by, you know, not, 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 not least by people who would previously have regarded the monarchy uh, in a negative light, was thought to be incredibly deficient in what we would probably describe now as empathy or the expression of emotion. Um, and to many people watching the scenes uh, immediately after Princess Diana died, um, what was generally called the outpouring of grief, completely wrong-footed quite large numbers of people because they found themselves living in an emotional universe um, that they hadn't realised actually existed. One which had been created, if you like, out of the war and out of the period of austerity. The period of one of my mother's absolute favourite phrases to me was, and to us, was, don't make a fuss. Don't make a fuss. Don't say anything. Boys don't cry. We were told. Boys don't cry. That's not a lie. That's not some kind of exaggeration. That's what we were told. To be that thing was not to express that thing. Um, 
Now, in that sense, I'm not trying to make out all boys are victims because they couldn't express themselves by crime. What I'm trying to point out is we have undergone a fundamental change about our attitude, or we are undergoing, about what it is, if you like, it is permissible or... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.